I am the first Kevin Kelly. There will be another Kevin Kelly who will not be me. It will be another Kevin Kelly. And um, Wired, Unwired, there's kind of a symmetry there. Um, Wired Magazine is one of them. Uh, I co-founded Wired um, almost over 15 years ago now. And um, actually, actually almost uh, 20 years ago. And so um, I've been talking about uh, not so much technology, but the culture around technology. And what I want to, to talk about, what I've been thinking about is what technology means in our lives, what it, what it actually, what, what the big story is about, about technology, because it's surrounding us, it's everywhere, and nowhere is it greater than in our cities and in our, um, the things that we built. But it turns out that we actually don't really have a very good idea about what technology is. That's one definition of, of what technology is. And uh, I think it's, you know, it's, that's kind of what we think about it. Um, or, or this one here, it's anything that doesn't work yet. But um, actually, it has to be more than that. It has to be more than just the recent stuff. Most of the technology in our lives, and the stuff that surrounds us here, is actually ancient. We've got some wood here, concrete, metal, light bulbs. All these things are actually very old. They've been around a long time. And I'm interested not in, 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 in the recent stuff, but the entire system that we've made. Um, and again, we see that nowhere more evidently than in, our, in the things that we constructed, uh, like our cities and our buildings. And um, if you take these two objects, which are about the same size, um, one of them, uh, the, the, one, the one on the left, anybody here, probably with a little bit of effort, could, could make one of these with, 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 some, with some patience. But the one on the right, nobody here can make. In fact, as smart as all of us are together, we could work for a long time and not, and not be able to produce us, even, uh, even the group of us here. And that's because the one on the right um, requires hundreds, if not other thousands, of other technologies to make it, to manufacture it, and to support it, and to keep it going. And that, th th those other interdependent technologies it, it, uh, make, create kind of a web, kind of an ecosystem, of, of technologies that are all kind of codependent upon each other. And I'm interested in that ecosystem of all these things that are dependent upon each other to keep going and to be made. And um, if we keep, you know, there's computers behind those, and those computers require thousands of other technologies to support it. And those other technologies of, of factories and steel furnaces require others and other technologies to co-create it. And if we take and stand back far enough, we, we have the largest system of all the technologies together. And I call that the technium, okay? The technium is all those things together. And, you know, uh, again, we, we see evidence of the technium in cities, which are just a very vast technological contraptions with hundreds, thousands, millions of moving parts and sub-technologies beneath it. But, but if we extend it far enough back, we understand that all these things are kind of codependent upon each other. And what we know about these very large systems is that they act differently than the parts. So what I'm going to suggest is that a spoon, which we make, or your shoe, or your iPhone, is not a lifelike system, but all these things together are. That there are certain behaviors that this system, this technium as a whole have, that are not present in the parts individually. Okay? And so I talk about what technology wants. And when I use technology, I mean what the technium wants, what the system wants. And I use the word want provocatively, but what I mean is that the way, the word, the way that plants want light. It's not intelligent, it's not conscious, but they lean towards it. They're sort of, they're sort of headed in that direction. There's a bias towards it. They, they, they're, 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 there is a general direction that they lean towards light. And that's what I'm talking about. The technium has certain leanings, certain biases. What are they? I know that technology can want something because I had that experience. Just uh, down the road here at uh, Will Garage near Stanford is a robotics company. This is the PD2. This is a robot that has been programmed to find its own power. So it roams around through offices. It's a help bot, and it roams around through offices, and it can locate a plug. It has nine eyes. It can locate a plug. It can take his tail, and it plugs itself in, right, with his hand. It just actually plugs itself in and re recharges itself. I stood between it and the outlet. It was very evident that it wanted electricity. <laughs> it was very, it wasn't going to hurt me, but it was going to get it. And so it's not conscious, 
it's not intelligent, but it has maybe the grasshopper level of survival saying, I need that electricity. And so I used want in this sense that there is a general bias in the system of all the things that we've made towards certain things. And my investigation was to say, what are those things? Because if we are making this world full of more and more technology, and it's having its own agenda, so to speak, outside of us, independent of us, but not completely, and I will explain that, what is it? What are the general things that, that all things being equal, this technology is leaning towards? And that's sort of what I've been investigating. So to cut to the answer, my conclusion is that what the technium wants is the same thing that evolution and life want. And I'll explain how I get there, but I just want to tell you where I'm going. And so the question, of course, is, well, what does evolution want? And this is a very controversial idea that evolution wants anything. Um, one of the late Stephen Jay Gould, who was one of the most um, vocal and brilliant writers on evolution, really is very adamant that there, that there was no wants in evolution, there's no progress, that it was completely random, that there was no, uh, there was all contingent. And that if you rewound the tape of life back to the first cell, on the first cell on Earth, and let it run again under the same conditions, that we would get something completely different. There's another band of people, including among them Richard Dawkins, a very big advocate of evolution, who really say the evidence shows the opposite, that if you rewind the tape, rewind the tape of life and run it again, you actually keep getting the same things over and over again. And when that's called covergent evolution, we have lots of examples of it uh, around the world. The, the eyeball, camera eyeball, was invented by different species 30 different times, different taxon. Uh, flapping wings was invented four times in the bats, insects, birds, and pterodactyls. And th there is a sense in which the mind, minds, little tiny minds, brains keep forming throughout life again and again. And they're, they're all independent of each other. And it's a sense in which there are certain forms, certain uh, biases that there is in the general system to bias in certain directions. And so I take that view of, of a progressive evolution that is not completely random, um, that actually, that it's going to, like well, many systems, if you rerun the systems over and over again, you, you discover that there are biases in the system. So what does evolution want? Well, when I say this is progressive, what I'm not talking about is this idea that there is a ladder of evolution and that the humans are at the top. But there is a long-term arc in evolution where you start with a little tiny, simple cell and over time, you get more and more complex things. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean everything is getting more complex because we still have those bacteria. And there are a lot of them. In fact, most of the life on Earth is bacterial. But the leading edge continues to get more complex, and that's true about obviously technology. Most of the technology in the world that we surround ourselves with concrete is not no more complex than the Romans made it. But the most complex that we make is more complex, and so there is a arc in that sense from the simple to the complex. And again, emphasize that this is not a ladder climbing up with the humans at the top. What you want to think of this as a radial explosion outward. There are about 8 million living species that we know about on Earth. All of them are all equally evolved. The, 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 you know, the, the horseshoe crab and, and, and the starfish and the bacterium and humans are, all have about the same amount of evolution, have undergone the same amount of evolution over time. We're, we're all equal distance from the beginning. And so there is, there is a sense in which this is a radial outward expansion of evolution and that, and that, that is the direction outward. That, that what I'm not, I'm not talking about a destiny, some destiny, some utopian endpoint that we're all going to. I'm talking about a direction of outward expansion, in this case, of complexity. Or diversity. One of the things that we see about life is that it gets increasing diversity over time. There's more and more diversity now than it was a billion years ago. And there's even more than it was two billion years ago. And there's even more than it was a million years ago. That the diversity of life on Earth continues to expand. That is the general trend of what evolution does. This increases the diversity of things that are available. Sure, some species go extinct, but there's more new species that are made than, that go extinct. So overall, there's a net gain in the number of species. 
if you make a list of the other things that we see in life, there's increased complexity, as I mentioned, increased diversity, increased specialization. The first cells were very general purpose. We made more and more specialized cells over time. In our own bodies, in your bodies, you have 250 specialized cells. You have cells, skeletal cells, you have heart cells, you have brain cells. And so, so we, as, as mammals, have more specialized cells than other organizations that were earlier in life. And so we see specialization increasing. We see mutualization, meaning parasites, um, symbiotes, dependencies on other living organisms, social insects. We see increase that socialization and mutualism happening in life over time. We see increased sentience, mindfulness happening in, in time. And the, the one I want to mention here, evolvability, which is a very big one. The thing about life is that over time, it constantly evolves life to become more evolvable. Okay? This is a really big thing. So life, the, the invention of sex actually increased the ability of life to evolve faster and greater. And the other inventions of like colonies, social insects, these were all devices in evolution to actually speed up the ways in which life as a whole could evolve. So we see the evolution of evolution. What, the way life is evolving right now is not the same way it was a billion years ago. And so, and so what it's doing is it's speeding up the evolution of the evolution process itself. It's kind of a meta, but it's very important because, as you'll see, this is what technology is doing. I'm making, 50 years ago was one of the most fantastic world-changing discoveries that ever happened, and that was when Watson and Crick decoded life and understood that it was a DNA code that it was actually information. But the essence of life was not energy, which is very important, it was not carbon, which is very important, it was not water. It was actually, the essence of life was information. That, that information, and, and even evolution itself, was an information processing system, and that what we saw in, in, our, in these living organisms was actually a lot, was mostly built on information and codes. Of course, that's what technology is. Technology is, Intelligence that we put into matter, to rearrange matter, we add information into it to make it into things that work for us. We take inert steel or iron or calcium and we add information into it and rearrange those molecules into something that works for us. So there is, in some senses, a, 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 an overlapping between life and what we make, and that overlapping is information. Okay, and so um, what that suggests is that what we see around us in the technium, we see the same kind of thing. Here are a bunch of spark catchers from the 1800s, and, you, and they're kind of lined up in this almost the same way that the butterflies in a museum would be lined up. You can see the same kind of diversity happening there. We see specialization in our tools. The first hammer is a general purpose hammer, that, that kind of stone axe was used for everything, and over time, they became more specialized. We made a metal hammer and a concrete hammer and, and a wood hammer. We had, we had more, we, now we have jack hammers and pneumatic hammers. So over time we had more and more specialization. Cameras, the first cameras general purpose, then we had high speed cameras, then we had underwater cameras, then we had high speed underwater cameras, we had high speed underwater infrared cameras. We keep making them more and more specialized. And what I'm going to suggest is that if you want to see where we're going into the future, you can just keep extending these things further. So in the future, we will have ever more specialized cameras. We'll have more specialized hammers. Anything that you pick up, we will say in the future, there'll be more specialized versions of that because that's the general trend. The genealogy of our manufactured inventions actually follow uh, a course of, of evolution and change that's, that's so much like life in the sense that, that, they, that they're following rules of, 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 of variation and adaption over time, that we can almost think of this world, this technium, as one of the kingdoms of life. These are the six kingdoms of life. These are the conical, the plants, the fungi, the animals, and there's um, three kinds of, of bacteria, little beasts, the microbes. Um, we can imagine, that in some senses, that the technium being sort of the seventh kingdom of life that comes off of the mammals. It is so lifelike in terms of 
if we look at how adaption runs through it, if we look at where it's generally going as a system, we can kind of imagine it as the seventh kingdom of life. Okay, so, so the question I'm asking is, what does the seventh kingdom of life, the technium, want? And my answer is going to be that generally it's going to want the same thing that a life in, in biology it wants as a system, which means that where the technium is going, where technology is going in the next 100 years, next 500 years, is towards increasing complexity. Anybody was hoping that the iPod and other things are going to make technology more simple is going to be very, very disappointed because it's going to become ever more complicated. If you think of a chicken egg, that's a wonderful, simple outer shell to a very complex system inside, and that's sort of what iPhone and iPad are. They're actually going to increase in complexity inside. It's going to increase in complexity in how they relate to other things. Maybe the interface will become like an egg and simple, but it's going to hide an increasing complexity over time. We'll have more and more devices. If you just look at the number of devices in our lives, it will continue to explode. The complexity of understanding how they work will continue to get greater. There will be more diversity in things. You look at the number of SKUs and manufacturing, will continue to make more and more kinds of things. The specialization will increase. There'll be Whatever we can imagine will become more specialized. The mutualism increases, meaning that more and more of the devices that we have will require other devices to support it. And in fact, we're making, if you haven't noticed at home, we're making these ecologies of things where they're all kind of, you know, this thing depends on the Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi depends on the internet router, the router depends on the Wi-Fi, and it's like, whoa! All this stuff is connected together, and everything has to keep going, and it's almost like an ecology, and that's going to be ever more so, that more and more of the things that we manufacture are actually just made to keep the other manufactured things going. We built our little homes for our cars, called garage, and um, we heat them up, and um, you know, uh, the, the, we, we make things, uh, a high, as a high percentage of the stuff that we make, and the energy we use is actually used not to heat us, or to move us, but to heat our technology and move our technology. This is the power use. So right now, three quarters of all the power that we use in the world is really made to service the technium and not us directly. For instance, when you're driving a car, about three quarters of that power is actually being used to move the car and not you. So, so we pay this sort of price and more, you know, most of the data in the world is not between humans and humans, this is between <coughs> machines talking to machines. We have machines transporting machines. And so seen from a systems point of view, that, that, that's actually increasing, where, 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 where the tech name itself is consuming more and more of the resources. So what are some of the things, what are some of the other things that technology wants? There are some of the other basic laws. Well, a, a simple one is, is Moore's Law, which has been around for almost 50 years now, which is, says that uh, the number of chips on a chip, uh, the number of transistors on a chip is increasing, doubling every 18 months, and the price is also having every 18 months. Um, but 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 this is the thing about this is no matter how hard people try to make it go faster, they can't make it go faster. It just goes. It's, it's actually that's almost that's an almost an exact law of a lot of law uh, chart. It's it's almost that straight, and it will, will keep going for some period of time. It's almost like there is. Like Leda wants that. that, that that technology is increasing or discovering itself at this rate, and one of the questions is, is this inevitable? So, so, so if, if you were to rewind, rewind the tape of technology and have it come out again, would we see Moore's Law? Is it, is it econo an economic law or a physics law? And, and actually, the thinking right now is it's based on physics, that that's just, if you were on another planet somewhere, and they hit a civilization, they probably would have Moore's Law as well. So, so, so there is built into it some sense of inevitability. There's another aspect of technology that we don't appreciate, which is that simultaneous independent invention is the norm. You can ask anybody else about this, anybody who's inventing, and they're always racing because they know that somebody else right next door is just about to invent whatever they're going to invent. And that's why we have a patent office. And, and, and if you look very carefully at every invention to the real history of it, you'll discover that there's usually one or two other people who came up with the same idea almost at the same time and are in some kind of dispute about it. 
The light bulb was invented 23 times before Edison invented it. Edison was the last of the first inventors of the light bulb. Now, what it meant was that um, the light bulb, as a generic idea of an incandescent, half-burning filament, was inevitable. But the actual specifics, the species of the light bulb was not, whether it was a screw-in, whether the gas was a vacuum inside or inert gas, whether it was a tungsten filament or carbonized, those were not. And that has a lot to do about the, the market and the economics and the inventor. So the species are not inevitable, but the general taxonomic category was, because it was time and, and it was someone who was going to invent it. And this is true for almost everything that we've seen, including brilliant geniuses like Einstein. A lot of people say, well, Einstein's theory of relativity was so far ahead that nobody would have come to it. Actually, uh, people were right behind him, and, and most experts would agree that maybe he might have been maybe 10 years ahead, but that was even that would have been generous, that, that, that somebody else was right behind him in discovering these things. And so what that means is that there's an inevitability in this course of technological development. That some technologies, most technologies, are inevitable in a certain sequence. And I did some studies about around the world in prehistory showing that the sequence of technologies in those parts of the world where there was no communication between them from one to, to another followed a very similar progression. So the web, for instance, is inevitable, but not what kind of web we have, not the species of the web, not the particular expressions about whether it's public or private, commercialized or nonprofit, whether it's uh, international or nationalized, whether it's what the protocol is, open or closed, all these things are the species we have some choice about it. But not that it's coming. And so there's lots of things that we see coming that are going to come, and we don't really, I mean, they're going to come. So our, 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 our choice is really in, in determining what kinds of things that we have. Robot-driven cars are coming. Your grandchildren will laugh at the idea that you, anybody was allowed to drive a car at 60 miles an hour on a highway, they'll find that just completely amazing because it's so unsafe. And the robots are going to be driving, you can turn your car over to the robot and just drive. And so that's coming, so like, there's a lot of issues. We get some choice about how that is, what that system's like, but not by the fact that the robots are going to drive our cars. So um, what I'm suggesting, suggesting is, is that um, all this stuff is happening, and, and, you know, and it may sound scary, I'm saying, well, okay, this, this technology is going to have its own agenda, but what about us? Okay, well, here's the thing about us, is that we are already technological. We, we, have, we humans have invented our humanity. Humanity is our first invention. The first animal we domesticated was us, okay? And we did that long ago, long, long ago, where we became wholly dependent on technology to live as a species. If you took every, if some laser beam came and vaporized every bit of technology in the world, including all our knives and our matches and everything, we, we couldn't survive with, without it. We, we, we need stuff. We don't have claws. We don't, we don't have teeth. We, we, we have domesticated ourselves to depend on technology. So like cooking, which is really an extended stomach, so we made this pot so we could cook and digest food that, we, that, our, that our biology could not do, that nutrition changed their bodies permanently, okay? We have to change the size of our teeth, our jaws. We became lactose tolerant in some, in some uh, races uh, as adults uh, very, very quickly after domesticating milk-giving animals. And so, and, so, and so that spread very rapidly. In fact, there was some time people believed that our biological evolution stopped once culture came along, that the thrust of evolution was sort of taken over by culture. But in fact, it turns out through looking at genetics that our biological bodies are now evolving a thousand times faster than they were 10,000 years ago. So we're actually speeding up our, our biological evolution and we are now completely dependent. We, we, we have re-engineered our body, bodies inadvertently to be dependent upon technology. And we're doing that even more so as we go along. We're not done yet. We're still inventing ourselves. Genetic therapies and all these other kinds of things, the prosthetics cuckle your ear, ear plants and, and all kinds of stuff, we are changing ourselves and who we are. And um, so there is a sense in which we are part of this thing. So it's not that the tech team is out there and there's us. 
We are part of the technium. And then this, this dual aspect where technology has its own agenda, it's kind of selfish, and yet it serves us, that's the origin of a lot of our conflict and our tension about our feelings about technologies. Because, yeah, sometimes it does great for us, but maybe we're kind of serving it. Maybe we're kind of like slaves to it. Maybe we're just doing it what it wants. And both of the things are happening at once. Because we, because it's a self-creation. And when you have self-creation, that means that you are both the created and the creator. So we have both created technology and we have been, and we are the creation of technology. We've created ourselves. So, so that, that paradox, that conflict is going to be there forever. And in a thousand years from now, people will still be wrestling with this idea, think, this feeling that technology wants something from us and that we're in control of it. I don't know, no, I want. And so that two-mindedness is inherent in, in the technium, in the technology. And so most of the problems that we have in the world are caused by the things that we have invented. They're technogenic. Okay? So, so we, have to, uh, we have to acknowledge the fact that, that, that most of the problems we're dealing with today are, are, have been made by our previous technologies. Most of the problems we're going to be dealing with a century from now are going to be generated by things that we're making today. Okay? So some people would say, well, that's kind of like a, that makes technology kind of like a wash, right? If it's making as many problems as we solve, then what's the point of it all? It's, it's, just, it's just kind of like neutral. And actually, I, re I reject that because here's, here's why. And that is, is, is because it, it, it turns out that um, we, we don't need very much advantage in technology. It can be 1%. If we can use technology to, to create 1% more than we destroy every year, that 1% compounded over centuries is progress. That's what civilization is. If we can use technology to create only 1% more than we destroy that, or maybe it's 10 percent it doesn't have to be very much. It doesn't have to be much better than bad to actually compound that over centuries to get something good. And I think I know where that 1% comes from, and that is, is that if you go back to that rock, the hammer, that hammer, when it was invented, created a new choice that we didn't have before. You can use the hammer to build something, or you could use the hammer to kill somebody. Even when you take the negative consequence, even when you use it to hurt, you still have a choice that you did not have before. And that's what technology is giving us. Every time we invent something new, we have new choices and opportunities that we didn't have before. And those new choices are the 1% advantage. Okay? So this is what we're getting. And when we have a bad idea, what do we do about those bad choices? Well, if we, if I were to, to spout some bad ideas here, nobody here would counsel me, you need to think less. Stop thinking. Okay? No, the response to a bad idea is, 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 is a better idea. And by the way, there's a better idea than that, just, just so we know. Um, that turns out, so that's the whole point, is, is that, okay, that turns out to be not such a good idea, so we have a better idea. And the same thing with technology. The proper response to technology that hurts or causes a reduction of options is not less technology. It's better technology, okay? So, what that means is, is that what we know in, in the course of things is that there is not been a single invention that we even come up with that we haven't been able to find a better, greener version of. So, so, so every time we think of something, we, we actually are able, so far, to, to actually devise or invent something that's greener. Which suggests to me that the technium, being the seventh kingdom of life, is not inherently anti-life. That it must be compatible with life. Because it's the seventh kingdom of life. And because we're always capable of inventing something that's more compatible with life in the natural systems. So um, what is technology giving us in the long term? What does it, what does, what does it mean? What, what, why should we bother making stuff? I mean, yeah, we're, we're making stuff, and lots of times it seems like we're just making crap, and we're just making consumer stuff, and this is more of this stuff in the world, and more that we have to take care of, and maybe it's distracting. And it may, that all may be true. But also, I think it's doing something else at the same time, which is that what it's giving us is giving us this progress. And this progress is built of, um, let me just go through here. 
the idea that we are creating, um, sorry, we're creating these things. Differences, diversity, options, choices, opportunities, possibilities, freedoms. That's what technology is giving us. It's creating almost as many problems as it makes every time, but it's also giving some incremental increase in those things. And this, by the way, is why people by the hundreds of millions are moving to cities. Why are they leaving these beautiful, idyllic villages in South China or, or in Indonesia or on the plains of Africa, whatever it is, with organic food and a great support of family. They're moving by the millions, as they have throughout history, going to the cities, because what cities give them is this. They're living in ghettos in cities, because even a ghetto and a slum in a city has more diversity, differences, options, choices, and possibilities than does their little village. Okay? And so cities are basically, as the largest pieces of technology that we have, they're demonstrating and they're, and they're conveying all these choices and possibilities. And so people move there, they leave, and they know what they're giving up because they go back to visit. They, 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 they know the beauty and, and the support and the centeredness and the satisfaction that you have in the village, but they're going to these grungy places because it's technological, because they're getting the, the, the benefits of technology. So, what if, what if what, this guy was, Mozart, was looking for technology would help express his potential and he found the symphony and, and the piano, but what if, what if he had been born before the technology of the piano had been invented or the symphony? What a loss to him and to us that would have been. Uh, what if Van Gogh had been born before we invented the technologies of oil painting and, 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 and that allowed his expression? What, what a loss to him that would have been. Or what if Hitchcock had been born before we invented the technologies of cinema and, and those opportunities? Well, that means that somewhere today, there, there's a young boy or girl, some Shakespeare of, of our era, who is waiting for us to invent their technology. So they have the full expression of their genius and can share us. And so therefore we have, a, I think, an obligation to increase the technologies of the world, to expand those possibilities for the children of today and the children of future generations so that everyone would have some potential chance to express their genius and share with us their potential. And that's why we want to increase the amount of technology in the world and that's sort of what technology wants because it's actually part of a cosmic force bigger than ourselves that connects everything, that has been increasing the possibilities and choices from the very beginning of the first elementary particle, increasing the diversity of articles, increasing the diversity of planetary bodies over time, that, that's, that's the Big Bang going out in time, and, and cre creating the, you know, from a few helium to the many, many kinds of elements that we have, that's the general drift, so it's actually not technology, actually its roots go back to the Big Bang, and this is a cultural force of self-organization that runs through the universe, runs through life, into the technium, is constantly self-organizing, and <laughs> cities are a part of that, and the things that we make are part of a very long trend, so, so actually when we're making stuff, we're actually partaking in something much bigger than ourselves, that goes back, this great arc of self-organization through time, and yes, we may be doing things in a tr for trivial market reasons, but we're actually increasing self-organization, diversity, complexity, and choices over time. And, and that's a really great thing to be involved in. That's a great arc that we're, that we're on when we get involved in technology and support it. So those are this expanding possibilities throughout the universe. If there's no destiny. I'm not talking about some end point, some omega point. I'm talking about this radio expansion out of increasing possibilities for everybody. And that's what technology wants. So thank you for your attention. There you go. Wait, hang on for a microphone, because I think they want to broadcast that. Um, yes, I'm, my name is Sharon Simons, and I'm the editor of a magazine called The Registry. It says nothing to do with real estate. But you're saying that, that you know, so what happens if um, you know, oil painting hadn't been around with yeah. Van Gogh? But wouldn't, if he's such a genius, wouldn't he have just used the technology at his disposal and been a genius in a different way? 
Um, he would have, he would have tried, and, and um, I, I I don't think I, I don't believe that was true. I don't I think I think that if Van Gogh had been born before oil paints, if they had been born 200 years ago, and all we had was cave paintings and charcoal, I think we would have done a pretty good job. But I don't think we would have seen the the Van Gogh that we see today. I really do believe that he. That that technology allowed him to express in ways that was not possible. Now it is possible that maybe Van Gogh was still born too early, and that we will invent something in the future that would have been even better for Van Gogh. That's possible, but I don't believe that he would have anyway been better off, or better, or even as good if he had been born two thousand years earlier. Yeah, there you go. Question. I'm just curious. Just flipping the side the other way. Yeah. Around, um, what if if there was no technology? And then probably you would have used your genius, doing something differently right. without the technology. That could have been even better than this. So thinking about not PowerPoint, for example. Yeah. And he would have had done maybe some fabulous other demonstration of right. other technologies without talking about technology, showing on PowerPoint. So are we not then kind of killing the other possibilities by kind of forcing or making our life mesh with technology more than what is required? Yeah. Of course. Now I'm using technology in the broadest sense. So we have to understand, of course, that reading and writing is a technology, right? And language, even to some extent, is, is, is something we've invented. So that's also a technology. So, so, so I'm, I, I, my definition of technology is anything that we have used our mind to make. And so um, I think maybe your question is, well, doesn't sometimes new technologies constrain, uh, prevent us from using old ones? And I think that is true, that there is some. But most of the time, it, it's very rarely when old technologies go away. In fact, I had a bet with Robert Kerwitz at NPR and other people that, that we could not find any example of a technology that went extinct. And um, somewhere in the world globally, somewhere in the world, somebody is still using and making brand new that technology, whatever it is. And um, there was a very long thing and we were unable to, even with this kind of crowdsourced out to the NPR audience, to find an example of some technology that is no longer being made brand new somewhere on Earth today. It, it's, so, so in that sense, technology is unlike biology because it doesn't go extinct. And we usually can find some old version of it somewhere. So the ideas kind of keep going. So, so technology doesn't usually, it, it does, things go obsolete, but they don't go extinct. So it can be hard, you know, buggy whips. They're not that so prevalent, but you can certainly buy a new buggy whip. Okay, and so, in fact, there are more blacksmiths at work today than have ever lived in the past. Okay, yeah, there's just kind of like, because of the number of people who have horses and stuff, and just the population <coughs> explosion. So, um, there, is, there is a kind of sometimes a constraining of things where you feel that there's an obsolescence, but in fact, if you're really dedicated, you can go and if you want to be um, a stained glass master, you can do that still today. Way in the back, the other guy with a hand up there. Can, do we have time for that? There you go. You're, she's coming right behind you. So, uh, how is our emotional relationship with yeah. technology? That's good. So, th there definitely is, I, I think we definitely feel as if this stuff is just happening faster than we can, than we can change. So in other words, the world seems to be changing much faster and accelerating. And when I, what I did mention about the technium is what technology really is doing is accelerating the evolution of itself, so, so the evolvability of it. So, so the the technium is really kind of biological evolution accelerating even faster. So, so this this evolution that we're seeing right now around us is happening so fast that we feel like, well, this is this exceeding our capacity to 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 adjust. And I have an answer for it, but it, it may not be a very satisfying answer. The answer is, is that I think the way we're going to adjust to this changing speed of technology is through more technology. That we're actually going to invent things to help us deal with the fact that we can't deal with the new technologies. Okay? And, um, and, and, and I have an one, one small example, which is that there's this kind of um, Barry Schwartz wrote this book about the tyranny of choice, the fact that there, if you have too many choices, you kind of get paralyzed, you walk into the grocery store, you see like 250 different kinds of mustards, and you can't even decide, so you believe without making any choices at all, or healthcare um, options in a package, and people decide 
they just can't deal with it. But they found out something that is if you give a default, then, then, then people can actually deal with this. And we, in our computer systems, know what defaults are. Defaults are a technological invention that help you deal with too many choices. And what it does is it conflates or compresses or hides your choices until you want them. Okay? And so there are all kinds of choices you have, most of us have, that we don't even know we have because we haven't needed them or we haven't looked for them. But we can go in and change the defaults. And th there are suddenly there's all kinds of choices that we didn't even know were available to us because we are being kind of hidden from them. That is a technological invention, a very crude type, that's helping us deal with the fact that there's so many choices. And I think we're going to continue to make, invent new things that will help us deal with the fact that we can't keep up. And um, that sounds like a very technocentric view of the world, but that's what I think I see happening, is, is, is that we'll modify ourselves, we use technologies upon ourselves eventually, but even in the meantime, just things that are around us to, to, to deal with the fact, to slow things down, to make them look like they're slower, um, and high choices to in some ways give us the facility so that we can actually deal with the thing going very fast. So um, I, mean, I see evidence of that happening already. Yes? I'm wondering about the well, hang, well, hang on one second. I, I think they might have in mind. And this will have to be the last question. OK. Um, you speak to all the positive benefits yeah. that have come out of the technology and over time, how things are constantly improving. But I'm wondering about the cost side of it. You know? <coughs> or is there a, you know, a warped, you know, or perverse side that comes out of some of that technology? You know? you know, does, does the good always win out over the evil? I, 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 no, I mean, I, I think, as I said, I, I suspect that 49% of everything we make is, is horrible. Crap. Dumb. Bogus. Harmful. Problems. Okay? Destructive. But 51% is great, fantastic, wonderful, good for us. That tiny differential there's, there's more good in the world than bad, but not by very much. <laughs> but that's all we need over time. Okay, so, so that, that, that tiny little incremental thing compounded over time is what gives us progress. Are there, are there, are there, are there technologies that are bad? Yeah, yeah, sort of like you know, spraying DDT over uh, agricultural crops. Uh, that was a total environmental disaster. However, the same molecule used Spraying around households is actually the best effective malaria eradicator, saving millions of hundreds of millions of lives a year that we know about. We just want to move move that job. But yes, we, we we're certainly capable. And most of the thing I'm just saying is that most uh, uh, you know technology is going to create almost as many problems as solutions. That's inherent. I'm not a utopian. I mean, most of the stuff we're making, like okay, here the most powerful technology we've made, the internet, right? Well, a technology is only powerful if it can be powerfully abused. It cannot be powerfully abused. It's not a powerful technology. We are going to abuse the, the, the power of, of the internet some way. It's just inevitable. Okay? We're, we haven't seen it yet, we, but we're, there will be ways in which it will be abused. And it will be really horrible. But those technologies, the technology of the internet, give us new choices and possibilities we never had before. And those new choices or what redeem it, because we've had, because, because that's what we're expanding, is expanding possibilities, opportunities, and that expanding possibilities is, is where the, the positive aspect of technology comes from. I really thank you for, for your attention. I'll be signing books over there at some point. Thank you.